So when you open it up, it opens up where you can still see the desktop and everything else. But if you are working on Windows, Photoshop opens up in what's called the application frame. They finally added this to the Mac in uh, CS5, and that made a lot of us really happy because the application frame allows the application to, you know, it's just a much cleaner work environment, and I like that a lot better. But it was missing on previous versions of Mac. Some Mac users were up in arms about how dare Adobe make the products look more Windows-esque on the Mac OS, blah, blah, blah. And Adobe pointed out that all of the native Mac OS applications were already using application frames anyway. So that uh, made people stop whining about it. But it's much better because now I have a cleaner work environment. Now if I look at the Finder, if I want to open something, I can go under File and I can choose Open. But I can also, on the Mac, at the Finder level, that allows me to navigate and see my folders and files and things. I can now look at the files that are sitting here. If I highlight those and drag those down to the Photoshop icon, it now is going to open those files. And we can now see how it opened those files and they're tabbed across the top of the screen. So I have each one of my picture files here tabbed across the top of the screen. So Photoshop in the application frame, the fact that I don't have everything is just five separate floating windows is how it used to be in older versions. This is a much nicer, more humane way of working in my opinion. So it's a better way to go. Now as you look at this, what we can do is we can zoom in, 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 and as I zoom in I start to see the individual pixels, the parts of the image that are there. So each one of these pixels and Photoshop has even given me a little pixel grid pattern, so it's showing that to me to further exaggerate what's going on. But I can see each one of these squares represents a dot in my image of color information. And those dots are what then become the printed colors when it's all done. Now, if I pull up my info window, we can go back to that whole RGB CMYK color information that was talked about earlier this morning. And you will see that if I move my cursor or my pointer over each one of these pixels, the color information is changing. So it's showing me what is the value, either a CMYK percentage or an RGB value of 0 to 255 of what is that color information. The, as I get close to white, the RGB values are very close to, they're well over 200. They're getting close to 255, but the CMYK values are getting close to zero. As I move into a darker color, I see the exact opposite. My RGB values are going down. My CMYK percentages are going up. So this is now giving us scientific exacting information, numerical data that we can use for mixing color versus just purely our uh, emotional perception of this is what I see, this is red, this is purple, this is, I don't know, this is kind of a neat brownish magenta color, yet that was hair. But it's this, you know, purple, so it's a nice kind of color. Now a little bit about the UI in Photoshop. The tools are always going to be down the left hand side of the screen. And when you look at the tools on the left, you will notice that there are very subtle divider lines dividing the tool. So I have what are referred to as my selection tools in the top section. Then I have my painting or creation tools. And then I have my vector tools. And then I have some of my um, kind of manipulation um, tools, my hand, which allows me to then kind of scroll around on the image so we can throw the image and zoom and look there's a giant eyeball coming up on screen. The magnifying glass allows me to zoom in but I am at my maximum zoom magnification of 3200 percent. So that's pretty significant that I've zoomed in so this little square is now at 3200 percent. If I change my view factor here and I go to actual pixels that is now 100% view. That is one pixel in my image, one of those dots that we just saw, to one pixel 
on my computer monitor, my screen resolution, which is different than the print resolution that you're going to be concerned about for your project. Because print resolution, we want higher than screen quality. Screen resolution is junk. It is designed for viewing on screen. It is approximately one quarter the resolution of what is necessary for a high resolution print. High resolution print typically uses a value of around 300 dots per inch or pixels per inch, which is considerably higher than the 72 pixels per inch that we use for screen resolution. Now these images were captured with a digital camera. I go under the image pull down menu and choose image size. I will notice that my resolution is set at 72 pixels per inch. So that is my screen resolution. And the cam digital cameras all take pictures at 72 pixels per inch. But we can see that the image itself is made out of thousands by thousands of pixels, looking at the width and height as a unit of measure in pixels. Now, if I were to change this and say enter in 300 and not change the number of pixels, we can see that the at a high resolution file, this could print out at 8.64 by 12.96, so approximately an 8 by 13 inch image is what would be able to print at high resolution from this digital camera file. So that makes it pretty significant quality. Uh, I think it's a 10 megapixel or so, I forgot. We can do the math if we multiply these two pixel values together, but I think the camera is a 10 or 12 megapixel camera, so it's significant in terms of it creates a decent size image at high resolution. So screen resolution 72, print resolution 300. So these images that we took today are considerably larger than what we're going to need even for the finished poster project, which is going to be six inches by nine inches at 300 pixels per inch. Now, I am going to create a new file by going to File and choosing New. And I am going to use my unit of measure as inches. My color mode, RGB. Now, if we notice, there are more color modes than were mentioned in the earlier lecture. We, not just the RGB and same YK, but those are the two that are most common that you will deal with most frequently. So we're going to use RGB. I'm going to set my resolution at 300 and the poster project is going to be a width of 6 inches and it's going to be a height of 9 inches. So when I'm creating my project I'm going to make it 6, 9, 300 as its size. And now it opens up and looks like this. Now if I look at the zoom factor I'm at 25 percent. I'm not at 100 percent. But if I want to see this whole picture on screen I can zoom out. Now there are nearly unlimited keyboard commands in Photoshop and people who use Photoshop a lot like to learn all those keyboard commands so they make themselves feel superior to their uh, surrounding human beings because they're like, I know more Photoshop keyboard shortcuts than you do. Uh, and that's fine and good. But there are certain advantages to learning some of them because it will increase your productivity. If I want to zoom in when I'm using some other tool, I could switch to the magnifying glass. The magnifying glass currently is set to plus, so it's going to zoom in. If I want to zoom out, I hold down the option key and now I can zoom out. I could have changed it up here by clicking up here to the minus and then clicking one like that and then change back to the plus. Anytime you take the time to click on something, then click and click, it's a very slow operation considering that zooming in and zooming out operates under the keyboard shortcut of Command plus, Command minus. So if I look at the keyboard and hold down the Command key and hit the key with the plus on it, it zooms in, hit the key with the minus on it, zooms out. So it allows me to zoom in and zoom out very quickly. And most people find that's a much better way of working than grabbing the zoom tool, choosing plus or minus up here and clicking on your image. Now grabbing the zoom tool, if you know you want to zoom in on say one person's face, it can be faster to then just drag and zoom. 
with it. So you can do it, and then we can zoom in and see individual pixels. Now if I want to scroll around my image, I can use the scroll bars, or I can hold down the space bar and drag, and no matter what tool is currently selected, the space bar and a drag will make it move. And CS5 introduced throw as an option, which is really kind of fun. See how I can throw and it just keeps going. And it just gives you a nice little visual. And it's a nice way of zooming in and zooming out and scrubbing around your image. So I can use these basic manipulation tools. Now across the top of the screen here, this is going to be my tool options bar. So it changes, all the options up here are going to change based on what tool I select. We can see across the top of the screen, all the options keep changing on me. Now I have my palettes on the side of the screen over here that we will get into more detail with. Layers palette, probably the most common. Color palette and swatches palette, we will be using those quite regularly. So, and the adjustments palette we'll get to at a future class session. Now there are other palettes that will come and go based on when you click on things. So this has turned these palettes into kind of a button mode. So you click on it, it shows up. You click on the arrows or click back on the button and it goes away. So that's a nice way of being able to move around the UI. So within Photoshop, I have my tools on the left, my tool options on the top, my palettes where I have access to all kinds of things on the right. Now periodically you will move things around, you will drag them over, and then you will have lost them. You'll be like, oh no, my styles are gone forever, my color is gone, and oh heck, or even you know, more importantly, my layers palette is gone. You're like, crap, ah, the world's going to end. And you're all freaked out about it. And you're, you're just a really unhappy camper. Well, at the top of the screen here, they've come up with a couple arrangements of how to arrange the different palettes and tools and other things on screen. And these different arrangements we can see up here. So if I click over design, design it, oh look, layers are back, swatches are back. But if I go back to essentials, it remembers how I broke it. But if I click under the arrows on the side over here, I will see that I have an option to reset essentials. Now on your own computer, you can actually then customize workspaces and save those and reload those and do things like that. But our computers won't remember that, so too bad. Uh, but on your home machine, you can do that. But if I choose Reset Essentials, you'll see now it's back to how it was. So now my workspace is back to the factory default. So that I effectively hit you know, Reset, and now it's back. But if I wanted to paint, could click on Painting, and notice I lost my adjustment layers, but now I get my brushes over here. So now I can play with the brushes. You know, wee, and uh, work here, and... Um, Oh, I have an eraser going. No wonder it's painting white. I was a little bit confused for a moment. Now, Photoshop maintained forever and ever and ever. Adobe said Photoshop will never have to, you know, it's like being in high school again. You scribble out someone's face in the yearbook and go, oh, I didn't like that person. But I don't really not like you guys. I'm just, you know, wiggling the brush around here. Uh, they said there would never be multiple undos in Photoshop. They said, no, we will never do that. It takes up too much memory. And lo and behold, I think it was version 5.5 came out and there was this magical thing called the history palette and in the history palette you could actually step back in time and it was really really cool because previously you had one undo so I could undo once it's like well that's not doing much and undo is going to be command Z on here undo notice it's grayed out at this point so I can't go any further so I can't go back in time any further, but I can step backward to notice that that weird symbol you see next to the command in the Z is the option key. So if you were working on Windows, it would be control alt Z. And on Mac, it's the command option Z. If you do notice on the keyboard above the word option, it does say alt. So that's trying to be uh, friendly to Windows users. But notice the command and control keys are separate and in different places. So if you go back and forth between the platforms periodically, your fingers will strike the wrong keys because you're trying to hit the control key and you hit command, and you're trying to hit command and you hit control. But that's just how it works. Now, if I go under the window pull down menu, here is history. I can see my history palette. I can even make it bigger so I can look. And I can just start stepping backward in time and 
making those go away. Now if I go back forward in time and erase some more or grab a paintbrush and start painting, we'll see that it now records that and I can just even uh, um, move things around. I can go now, now, go back to open, now I'm back to the very beginning. So the fact that we have a history palette is a really, really cool thing. It means you, you don't have to save quite as often. It's very important that when you work in Photoshop you save frequently and save often because it will sometimes crash. It's not like it used to be. It used to be a regular crasher. If you dealt with high resolution artwork, it, you could pretty much guarantee it would crash every time you worked. That was normal. It crashes so infrequently now that it's really easy to get lazy about saving. But if you work for two, three, four hours on a project and haven't saved and it crashes, well then there's not a lot of sympathy to go around. Anytime you make significant or substantive changes to your project, you should be saving. And it's not a bad idea to save multiple versions when you start making bigger changes to things or you hit certain milestones because then that extra version means you can go back to it when a file will corrupt. Photoshop files are notorious for corrupting when you send them across a network specifically when you save across a network. So if you try to take from your computer and save to a network storage drive, not to your flash drive or to the hard drive, there is a tendency for Photoshop files to corrupt themselves. So it's very important that you save locally on some sort of media, whether it's the hard drive, flash drive, storage drive, something, and then you transport it across the network. But saving across the network for many years was a known bug in Photoshop and it did cause your file to corrupt with almost 100% certainty. So it was bad. Very bad. So just keep that in mind when you're working. All right. So now that we've seen a little bit of the basics of the program, where some of the things are, now it's time to start doing some things with it. Now, one thing that Photoshop introduced uh, and I think it was uh, CS5 as they introduced content to where delete, which is really cool. And it works when you're deleting something on what is referred to as the background layer. My layers palette, I can see over here where it says background. So uh, let's see, oh, wrong option there. Um, so, so I don't keep always picking on the same people. And I will cycle through pictures, so hopefully nobody's going to feel overly uh, picked on today. If I make a selection of somebody or something, I can do something to that. I can paint directly using a paintbrush. I can choose a color and I can paint directly on this layer. And we'll get to content to where delete momentarily for those who are like, what is that? But um, I can change to a new color. Now if I don't want to mix it with my swatches, but I want to uh, have my color information. <coughs> Pull up my color palette. Here's my color palette. Now I have RGB, and I can try and mix those. And as I said, it's kind of hard to do that. But if I want to choose a new color, I can go grab a color in here and mix it. I can change. Whoops, wrong, wrong button. I can change to use HSB sliders, so I can decide. Leaving saturation brightness the same, I can choose new colors. So again, I really am a big fan of HSB versus RGB color sliders because they just seem to logically make a little bit more sense. But Photoshop is warning me of something. It gave me a little warning triangle here. And let me see if I can mix that color up again. That warning triangle is indicating that the color I see on screen, this really, really bright green, isn't going to be able to print very well it's giving me that warning and if I click on the triangle it moves the color to something that is closer to something that can print so if we notice that bright green as I paint next to it with the uh, other color you can see there's a difference so it's telling me that bright green would probably print out like this much duller color again the problem of RGB and CMYK colors not being in perfect harmony or alignment with each other so when you mix colors, if you see the triangle there, click on the triangle, it will reset it to something that is going to be more print safe, and then you won't be as disappointed when you try to output your project. So if I want to paint, 
I can work with that. I can choose different brushes and I can mix different brushes up here. Now one thing about the brushes is that the brushes are going to be able to be bigger and smaller and they can have a different hardness. If they have 100% hardness, we can see that they have a very crisp edge. 100% softness or lack of hardness means it's all fuzzy on the edge. I can make my brush bigger, smaller. I can choose different shape brushes. And a quick keyboard command for making brushes bigger and smaller without having to choose that is the square bracket keys and it will make your brush bigger or smaller. So you have quite a few options available to you. Now, all of these paintings and other things I've done are kind of in the way of what I want, but I can paint directly on artwork. But that's not that exciting. Now, content to where delete when you have a background layer. So I'm not on a new layer, which we'll look at new layers momentarily. If I make a selection, using my top tools for selection. Now it used to be people would use like the magic wand and you'd have to have a very steady hand and you'd try to choose something, make a selection. And so it, it's not very easy to do when you have a mouse. And then you're like, well, there's my selection. And these marching ants, the little dotted flashing line, indicates the perimeter of the area I have selected on my artwork. Now this selection, while it's selected, if I hit the delete key, traditionally if you're using pre-CS5, um, it would have filled that section with the background color and it would look like this when I hit delete. My background color as I see in the left hand side of my screen is white. My foreground color is green. So it filled it with that background color, white. Now we can see that even though the screen behind was mostly white, it's not white white. So that probably wasn't a good option, but if I hit delete and instead of using the background color, I can now use content to wear. It's thinking and it got pretty close except that it realized there was something, where is that on that screen? Let's find out. So it, it grabbed information from the board over here and tried to fill it in and said, you know, I think you know you might have wanted that. So I'm like, no, I don't think so. Now content to where delete with the right artwork, done just right, can actually work out pretty good. Now it oh funny, it picked up the monitor. <laughs> so it's getting some weirdness, but if I look at the top section over here in the screen area, it's pretty clean. So if you get an image, like I took a picture of my neighbor's deck and deleted his stairs from his deck, I took a picture of my deck and used content to where delete to get rid of my stairs because I had you know, a nice wooden set of stairs. My neighbor had this beautiful metal spiral staircase so I took his staircase and put it onto my deck and then texted him the picture when he was up at his cabin um, two summers ago. And then I'm like, hey, thanks for the stairs. And he's like, what? And was initially freaked out because it was his stairs, but on my deck. And I'm like, yeah, we had a bad storm and they fell down. So I put them you know, where they look better. And he was a little bit, I mean, he, we laughed about it. We're good friends, but content to where delete allowed me to delete my stairs in the span of about a minute. And that was stairs, you know, where you see kind of sky and grass and other, and boom. One minute I had them all cleaned out, took his stairs, cleaned out the background in those, put them on mine, and it was done. It was that easy. But content to where to delete only works to background layers. When it's not a background layer, it deletes the pixels, leaving behind transparency, which we'll look at momentarily. So remembering that part of this project is going to be moving people around into different images. So if you need to put yourself, let's see, no, yep. So if you need to put yourself, I might as well pick on myself now for a little bit. If I need to put myself, I can use the magic wand and do a selection like this and it selects this. Now 
If I want to add this to my poster image, to a new file, probably the easiest way to do that is going to be to copy it, because I made a selection. So then copy is available. If I don't have a selection, notice copy is grayed out. Whenever you're working in Photoshop, you'll notice that there's more palettes, more tools, and more pull-down menus than you know what to do with. Take a deep breath. Think about what you're trying to do and start looking through the pull-down menus to find something that sounds appropriate. We're not doing 3D in here. We won't be using analysis, so you know those two menus you don't need to pay attention to right now. So that takes out two of them. Uh, filters we will use, select we will use, image edit. But right now I want to copy something. It's grayed out because I have nothing selected. I haven't indicated what I want to copy. So if I want to copy, well, oh, missed, all of me. So I've made a selection. I can go under edit and I can choose copy. Now if I click over to my empty file, I can look under edit and I can choose paste. And there it is. Now, if I look at my layers palette, I will now see that it added me to layer one. Layer one did not exist previously. If I want to bring someone else into the picture, or a whole bunch of people, so I'm using, I'm very quickly selecting and if I want to bring these people over, I can copy, which also is on the keyboard, if you look and see where you have Z, X, C, and V on the keyboard. Those four keys are really important keys when you work on a computer. They represent undo, cut, copy, paste in every program. They are effectively reserved as default keyboard shortcuts, undo, cut, copy, paste. Most people who are power users in Photoshop have their left hand glued to the keyboard, their right hand on the mouse, because that allows them to do all the keyboard shortcuts with their left hand, mouse with their right hand. If you're using a drawing tablet, then that replaces the mouse unless you're left-handed. And then you suddenly find all your keyboard shortcuts go away in Photoshop, and it makes you feel far less productive, but you can draw that much easier with it, according. So I made a selection. Now if I'm going to bring this into my other composite image, I can go under edit and I can choose copy and then I can click over to that file and I can paste which is command V. And now if I paste that in I can see it, that put it on layer 2. Now if I switch to the move tool, it's the top tool in my tool palette, I can now move this layer around. Now, you may be starting to realize that if I want to put all these people together into a single image, I'm going to have some problems because that whole row that I just pasted in does not fit cleanly on screen because they're too big. Their egos are taking up too much space and they just don't want to play nice. And they're also obscuring me. And well, that's just not going to do. But the good part is because I have layers here, I can just move my layer up. And now I am on top again. But as you can see, the background around me is really kind of interfering with the picture. I'm going to turn off their layer so I don't have to see that momentarily. And then I will bring them back. So now here I have my layer. If I want to get rid of what's around here, Back in the day with Photoshop, I would have zoomed way, way in. And then I would use the eraser tool, and I would try to very carefully work around the image and hope that I don't end up with this kind of halo effect around it, where when it's done, yeah, and that's what we used to do. And it sucked. It really did. But. Thankfully, Photoshop has better tools now, and the um, selection tool, the quick selection tool, I was trying to blank to the name. If you ever forget what a tool is, 
hover your mouse over it and the tooltip will come up and it will tell you quick selection tool. There you go. The quick selection tool now allows me to click and it said, oh look, hey, I think that's all related color. And now it's selected that whole edge along. But notice it's going to cut my hand off. See the problem there? If I hit delete now, oh look at that, I'm missing a hand. Which could be okay for a science fiction project like your poster that I could replace it with a cool robotic hand or you know a big claw or maybe it's a lobster claw because science fiction and we had a radiation accident and now my DNA got combined with the lobster and I got a giant lobster claw and I go around and I squish people with it. I don't know. Something. Sounds like a bad comic book. But while I'm using the direct selection tool or the quick selection tool there. If I zoom in a little bit, I can see that, well, it didn't get my hand. But if I look up here, I can see I have the quick selection tool. Then I can add to it or subtract from the area I'm trying to select. And if I look closely, I'll see that there's a plus right now. And just like the <laughs> magnifying glass tool, if I hold down option, it gets to be a minus. And now, I clicked on my hand and said, oh, okay, I guess you did want that. And notice there's going to be a little part around my thumb here where it's not going to do a great job. But I can, if I have to clean that up with the eraser, that's not so bad. That's one, you know, I'll have a few little spots to clean up. Okay, so I now made that selection. Now if I, I'm back to the plus again, click over here and, well, apparently it just thinks my arms are the same color as the screen. And we're missing that finger tip right there. Now, if I zoom in, it might be easier to zoom in and work my way around the image as I do this. Now, it's cutting off my finger. Notice the size of this is actually, it's working like a paintbrush. And I can now make this smaller using the square bracket keys, just like a paintbrush. And I can see the size is changing up here. So I can add. Oh, sorry, I, I want to subtract. I was going the wrong way there. All right, so it, I'm going to have to manually clean up that little blobby section right there. Just make sure it's not cutting off too much finger. And if I hit the delete key now that I've selected the area around me, we can see that it gets rid of it pretty readily. If I turn back on the previous layer, you can see now. Now, this selection here is still active. Select pull down menu allows me to choose deselect. And now we can see. Look at that. And what used to take hours. If I said here, here's your four pictures and make a class composite so it looks like you were all standing at the front of the room at the same time. It used to take about two hours. It's possible with the quick selection tool to do it in about 15 minutes because it is that much faster now. So you can start extracting individual people and compositing them all together. And then you can go stick in some fictitious background. Imagine we're all on some Tahitian island enjoying the beautiful uh, warm waters. Sounds good to me. I'd be happy to go to a Tahitian island right now. But there's quite a bit of play available. So once again, all these people here. Now I'm moving that layer. If I go and select layer two, I can move that one. If I want to start cutting these people apart so I can put them in individually, I can start trying to. Sometimes it will be easier using the quick selection tool to work on the person versus trying to do the background. Because when you're trying to do the background, sometimes that will work. But other times, it's easier to try to coax the person out. And it, it starts to become a little bit like, oh, I went one step too far because now it shows the whole poster. But if I start, hold down Option, and now I'm subtracting from it. Then I can go back and 
So very easily I was able to now select one person and because I don't want them in that background anymore I could just as easily use cut and now if I choose paste puts them on on layer so now she is free to move around and put her layer above mine and now okay now that that gets kind of funny <laughs> We, we have to come up with, you know, what tragic accident befell your uh, lower <laughs> legs, but, you know, at least, you know, I do hope that you, you have a little bit of fun with it because part of working in Photoshop is really exploring the fun because it can do some creative things, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit this morning. So if I want to extract a person versus bringing the whole person over, I want to just bring a individual I could use the quick select tool, zoom in, and let's see. So we're just going to do this as a waist up. Zoom out a little bit. And now though, people who are standing in front of the white screen are going to find that they are much easier to move around. So now I can copy that. I could copy cut, doesn't really matter because now when I paste it here, um, at least it shouldn't have. Edit, copy, and paste. Apparently I missed something on the keyboard shortcut. Now if I want to get rid of his hand, this would be an opportunity. I could use the eraser tool. I make the brush bigger. I can do it very quickly. Nice part of it. Now he's covering me up. Now we can see it got a little bit in the arm. Need to manually get rid of that, but you now that's an easy enough fix. So now you can start to bring people from different pictures, and your job is going to be to put everybody in the class into a single image and making yourself front and center and more important and better looking than everybody else. Now that's easy, I know. I mean, for some of you, that's going to be. Uh, extremely easy actually for all of you and see oh look at this and if you want to you know you know I would say you know be semi respectful to your classmates but you know if you do need to you know express frustration because you had your picture taken today and you're just unhappy now if I want to delete my head here it's not working because I have to pay attention to what layer is active so if I go to my layer, and I can verify that by clicking the eyeball on and off for it, I wanted to get rid of my head. So this is kind of, uh, you know, I could go, we've got Halloween coming up, so there we go. I, oh, with my arms out, that would have been perfect. I should have just cut my head and put my head in my hand like I'm holding it, and that would be good. I could, you know, paint in a little bloody stump at the neck, and it'd be perfect. Perfect for Halloween. So. There's no limit to what you can do, but you know if you do need to, you know, uh, move something over. Oh, wrong. And now I've performed a little bit of um, surgery here. Okay, so there, there's just, when you're working in Photoshop, ultimately what you're going to find is there's, the only real limit is you and your imagination because the tool is capable of doing so many different things.